I've been watching it. I don't know that I recommend it. It's funny, but I've been watching Jewish matchmaking on nice. Netflix. What a great way to begin our class. <laughs> Welcome everybody to our class that shall not be named on Wednesday. We are not talking about matchmaking yet, but we can talk about that at another point because matchmaking is still pretty popular in some places. Um, it's not done the exact same way for people in our world. But... I've been watching, it's, I don't know that I recommend it, it's funny, but I've been watching Jewish matchmaking on nice. Netflix. Oops, I got to turn great way to... Now, um, it was it, the matchmaking show you're watching, is it like a reality show or is it a as a reality show all right so welcome to everybody I hope i hope genevieve you know lou i hope you lou you know genevieve and ron and arlene and eva i don't pause there so we're going to look at shavuos today um, as it is tomorrow which is the most important holiday with the worst um worst what's the word worst publicity firm because it's nobody knows about it or people know less about it. It comes at the end of the year, it's in the summer or early, like in May, late May. Uh, it doesn't have the hook of fasting or the shofar or building a sukkah or the seder. You know, what you do is you study and you eat cheesecake. So <laughs> it's a little different. But yet it's just as important. It is one of the five major holidays that are celebrated one time. In the Torah, it is given the same level of respect as Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Passover. So it's one of the five major holidays. So we're going to look at it. And we're going to look at a lot of texts that are connected to it. Um, and then go through some of the texts for it. It is... Not my favorite holiday, mostly because I am dairy intolerant. So as I usually refer to it as Yom Kippur 2. <laughs> Can't eat any of the food, but we will be having fish. I think we're having fish that fish and but we can't have non-dairy desserts. And uh, so it'll be fun. So it's traditionally a different type of holiday, but let's go over some of the origins of the holiday, and unfortunately I forgot to take out some of the translations that say the word Lord, so that's my bad. So as you can see, wait one second, I'm gonna go back and make sure I'm in the right view. Yes, I'm gonna do it speaker view. All right, now we'll go to it. So if you look at this, you'll see Shavuos in the text. Uh, can everybody see it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. So um, we have an excerpt from the Festival of Kiddush, but we're going to first go to a couple places where we see it referenced in the Torah. Now, remember, whenever you have holidays in the Torah, these are the ancient holidays. So a lot of the traditions come later on. I'm going to change the word here to eternal. Uh, does anybody want to read this? Can you read if you're able to? I don't know if it means it's big enough for you guys. Yeah, your print is very small. Okay, so I'll read it for people. Or maybe I'll, I can also increase it. And the Eternal spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, so I gotta, When you, and I have, yeah, I, gotta, I forgot to change these. When you are come to the land which I give you, shall reap the harvest thereof. Then ye shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priests. So this, of course, is then a harvest festival. It deals with the harvest, as does Sukkot and Passover. So it's one of the three harvest festivals. And he shall wave the sheaf before the eternal to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath shall peace be found. And in the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer the he lamb without blemish of the first year for the burnt offering under to the eternal. So basically, if it is a this type of festival, a uh, harvest festival, you're going to be sacrificing animals to God to thank God for the bounty. You're also, in this case, going to sacrifice, and the meal offering thereof shall be two tenths part of an epa, a fine flour mingled with oil. 
If you want to know what an epa is, the length, please ask Genevieve. She's an expert on the ancient types of measuring systems. Offering made by fire to the Lord for sweet savor, and the drink thereof shall be wine, the fourth part of hen. So you will have, so again, as you can see, a lot of this does not really relate to us today. And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor fresh ears until this self same day, till have you brought the offering of your God as a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. So you're supposed to postpone eating certain kinds of food until after the sacrifice. So it's not like um, Passover. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the day of rest. And that means you're going to count after the day of Passover, the first day of Passover, seven weeks that will be complete. So on the day after Passover is day one, and you get to 49 days, and then the next day is Shavuos. Even unto the morrow after the seventh week shall you number 50. So, and you, so there is no set day for, uh, for Shavuos. It's set according to Passover. Passover. So that's how the day of Shavuos got decided by the Passover day. So it's kind of, and, it, and we're going to talk about that reason. Uh, the reasoning for that, because these two, this holiday Shavuos is linked to Passover. You shall bring out your dwelling two wave loaves of two tenths of parts of an ephah. They shall be fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven first fruit. So it's not an unleavened holiday. And you will bring bread with the bread, seven lambs without blemish of the first year. One young bullock and two rams, and they will be a burnt offering to the Lord. So, as you can see, meal offering their drink offerings. You shall have offer a he goat. You'll wave the bread. You'll make a proclamation. You don't do work. So, what we see now, according to this passage, in um Leviticus is we have the most boring holiday of all time <laughs> because there is no hook it's basically it's a no work day which all the holidays are no work day you do sacrificing of animals and some other things which you do on all the holidays the only difference is the date it's 7 it's 50 days after passover so um, there may be, you know, that's really the only thing you see in here that, so whereas the other four holidays all have something special, Rosh Hashanah, you blow the shofar. Yom Kippur is a day of self-sacrifice, which became fasting. Uh, Sukkot, you build the booth. You build the sukkah. Passover, obviously. Uh, you don't eat bread. So this holiday, on the other hand, is a little less specific as to what you're doing for it. It's basically, it's a harvest holiday, and you're going to do some sacrifices, and they give the date. We're going to talk then about what are the traditions and how they all come later, because we don't see, does it say here you're going to have cheesecake or milk? doesn't say anything about it'll be a holiday where you have milk. Uh, that obviously is later. It is a wheat harvest. It's a fruit harvest. That, and I'm not a farmer, so I don't know exactly how that's done. But we see that. Now let's see if we get anything else. In Deuteronomy, seven weeks shall you number unto thee. From the time the sickle is first put in the standing corn, it'll be that's the day after Rosh Hashanah, seven weeks, nothing new. And you shall keep the Feast of Weeks. So we now know it's called the Feast of Weeks, obviously, because it's seven weeks. Unto, God, unto the Lord, and you will measure a free will offering by hand, more sacrifices. And you shall rejoice with your son and daughter and the Levite. And again, Nothing new unto the sun. 
So what we see here is a holiday that its basic different traditions are post-biblical or at least post-Torah. All the holidays have things that they learn at the Rosh Hashanah is not called Rosh Hashanah until after the Bible. We don't get the official idea of fasting on Yom Kippur until after the Bible. It's called, you know, self-restraint. In the, in, in, in the, so there's always things that change, but there's really no unique aspect to this holiday beyond what type of sacrifice and that it's seven weeks after Passover. So for all of these things, we're going to have to look later on to see some of the traditions and see what we see later. So, um, and if anybody's willing to read, I can enlarge it. I'm happy to. So next we get Pesikta Zotarta, which is a commentary on Leviticus, which comes, as you can see, in the 11th century. Yeah, I can read that. I don't know what I did, but I greatly uh, made it. Okay, great. I'll enjoy, I can even uh, increase it more, Ron, if you want. No, that's good. That's good. Okay, I, great. No, so if you read words, you shall. No, you got to make it smaller because the pictures on the side are. How's that? Cutting off. That's good. All right, perfect. You, <clears throat> you shall declare a holy assembly on this very day, Levite uh, 2321. This refers to the 50th day, the day the people of Israel stood uh, before Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. All right, right pause, there, pause there for a second, Ron. Okay. <clears throat> now we have a hook. It's not in the Torah we read, but it is here. Mm -hmm. Ron, what did you just read? What is the 50th day? It is the day what? The day the people of Israel stood before Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. Exactly. There we go. That's the hook. But, of course, we see it now in the 11th century CE. Would you keep reading, Ron, where it says our ancestors? Yeah. Our ancestors received the Torah 50 days after leaving the land of Egypt. And therefore, the festival of the first fruits falls 50 days after the first day of Passover. The people of Israel are thus referred to as the first fruit. As in, I found Israel as pleasing as grapes in the wilderness. Your father seemed to me like the first fig to ripen on a fig tree. Um, similarly, the verse states, as an apple tree among trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the others. All right, keep going. Just as the apple tree produces its fruit 50 days after blossoming, so the people of Israel received the Torah 50 days after leaving the land of Egypt. Okay, so now Israel is the first fruit. We're special. Why are we special? Why is this holiday different from the other holidays? Because it is celebrating the receiving of the Torah. The moment at Mount Sinai where God gives the commandments to Moses, that is now what Shavuos becomes. And that's what it is to this day. But as we read in Leviticus, uh, number uh, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Exodus, that part of it is not mentioned in the Torah. So it comes later. So that is what we now celebrate Shavuos is, is the holiday of the receiving of the Torah, or some would say the Ten Commandments. Now we're going to read another one here from Sefer Hachinuch. This is from the 13th century. Uh, from Rabbi in Barcelona. Does anybody want to read this one? It says, according to the straightforward meaning. Well, I'll read it. Uh, if Perfect, Ron. You did, so, you did good, so if you don't mind. According to the straightforward meaning, the purpose of this precept is to indicate that the essence of the people of Israel is the Torah. And it was for the sake of the Torah that heaven, earth, and Israel were created. For the Torah, we were redeemed from Egypt in order to receive it at Mount Sinai and fulfill it. 
the receiving of the Torah was of greater consequences, consequence to uh, them than the exodus from slavery. Because the Torah is the essence of Israel, and for it they were redeemed and elevated to greatness. We were commanded to commence counting from the day after the first day of Passover until the day of the giving of the Torah. This demonstrates our great desire to reach the awesome day, for we desire it as eagerly as the slave desires to sit in the shade. Therefore, we keep a constant count to mark when that desired time of freedom will come, because keeping count of time is an indication of a person's longing and hope to reach that particular time. All right, so this is a helpful <clears throat> one. We count. We count the 50 days, so each day we count, as if to say we're getting closer and closer to the receiving of Torah. It's like building the excitement. We call that counting the Omer. Also, it says a little bit extra about the Torah. The, it says for Torah, oh, the, right up here, and it was for the sake of Torah that heaven, earth, and Israel were created. If it's for the sake of Torah, that would indicate that from this perspective, Torah was written before the creation of the earth, the creation of the universe. So God made the Torah, then God said, I have to do the heaven, earth, and were created. So it shows the importance of Torah that it predates the creation of the world and that God is giving it to us. And we're counting up to this day we get it. And so the exodus from Egypt is just the beginning. The conclusion to the story or the crescendo is the receiving of the Torah. As we say, leaving slavery was not enough. You needed to have a purpose. Our purpose was the Torah. So freedom is only worth value if we have a reason to live or we have a purpose. Um, Go and read Pirkei to Rabbi Eliezer. You want to keep reading one more, Ron, where it says Moses went to the sure. camp. Moses went to the camp of the Israelites and awakened them from their slumber, saying, Wake up, for the groom has arrived and desires to bring the bride under the marriage canopy. He is waiting for her in order to give them the Torah. The best man came and brought the bride out just as a person does for his friend. For the verse states, Moses took the people out of the camp to greet the Lord. You got to move it back, Rabbi. I know. Sorry, I'm just trying to fix this. All right, there you go. <clears throat> a little more, because you got your cut off with the pictures on the side. Sorry about that. I should have fixed this while back. There you go. Almost. There you go. Okay, the groom also came out to greet the bride and to give them the verse. Oh, I don't know if there's any other words in there because you got the pictures. The, the verse states, Lord, when you went before your people, that's all I can read because that's all that that's all that's there. So <laughs> Moses took the people of the count to greet the Lord as a bride and groom come to meet to get the Torah. So it's, it's such an awesome day. It's kind of like your wedding day. It's the most important day of your life. Now, so we know it is the holiday of the receiving of the Torah. Now, we know we count the Omer. We count the days to it because uh, Torah is our purpose. But what are, what's the other tradition? And if we look on this commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, which comes from the 17th century, we'll see possibly the origins of the most, one of the most famous parts of Shuvos now. And that is, um, does anybody else want to read? If not, I'll have Ron read again because he's doing so good. All right, Ron, would you read it? Which says, in yeah. the Zohar. In the Zohar, it states that the pious ones of ancient times would remain awake 
the entire night occupied in Torah study. Most of those who study follow this custom. The straightforward explanation might be that the people of Israel at Mount Sinai slept the entire night and God had to awaken them. Therefore, we must rectify that. All right, so we already saw how Moses had to wake up the people. So now they've used that and the idea that this is the study of the, that we're supposed to stay up all night and study Torah. So it becomes a late night study session. Places like New York and Israel, they'll have like, you know, classes all night long. Like you can go sign up for a 3 a.m. class or 4 a.m. class. We here will just study late into the night. We don't stay up all night. Um, but again, that became the that's become the tradition that we see is this idea that we study all night. And, but we see it's not from the Torah. It is a later, so we saw how it evolved over time, how it became holiday of the giving of the Torah, how in the 17th century, according to the Zora, the Zohar, the mystics said, let's go ahead and make this an all-night study session. So here is uh, what I was talking about. It's, uh, and I, I can read this one if you want, just a little bit. You can see it's a long article about Tikkun Lel Shavuot. That's what we call the study session at night. Tikkun, uh, studying Lel in the evening of Shavuot. And this is from a reporter in Israel. Originally based on a Kabbalistic concept, Tikkun Lel Shavuot programs in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem are drawing droves of secular people thirsty to know more about Jewish and Israeli culture. Natan Alterman could not imagine such a sight. At 3 a.m. on the night of Shavuot holiday, hundreds of people crowd into the auditorium of the ZOA house in Tel Aviv to hear a lecture on his poetry. Can you imagine going at 3 a.m. to go <laughs> study poetry? Outside, dozens of fans who didn't manage to get a seat in the auditorium. Not only are they studying poetry, but it's sold out and there's a waiting list. Stare disappointingly at the guard who closes the door and suggests that they wait for the next lecture at 4 a.m. So that was the scene he was talking about, that this Kabbalistic is now becoming also popular with non-Orthodox and non people who are a little bit more um, uh, either secular or not orthodox. So how this study session has become part of it. Now, how many of you have ever participated in a late night or all night study session on Shavuot? All right, I guess this is your year. <laughs> so what you study can be different as what we saw, they're studying Israeli poetry from a pretty well-known poet. And whereas in certain circles, they'll be studying, you know, Talmud or reading and studying the book of Ruth. Uh, we don't see that the book of Ruth yet is connected to Shavuos. That will come later as well. So if you didn't know, for a lot of the holidays, there's usually an extra book that is uh, associated that comes with the Bible. And for this holiday, it is very connected to Ruth, uh, probably because in Ruth they talk about the the um, the the farming and and the all of the things that we see here. So we're going to read the book of Ruth, edited. Now. Where did, you, where did we see the part about cheesecake and dairy? We didn't yet. So that did not, we didn't talk about it, but it later on becomes a holiday of dairy because probably Israel is known as the land of? Milk and honey. Milk and honey, exactly. Thank you, Lou. You're and that's why dairy. So, but again, dairy is not as exciting or interesting as eating matzah, not having bread or fasting or apples and honey, or all the fruits you hang in the sukkah. 
So and it's not really that different from what you do usually. I mean, cheesecake is not a rare thing in the Jewish world. So, but as with a holiday like Purim, this holiday has a book. So all the holidays have a book from the Bible added to them. For instance, Rosh Hashanah we know is the book of Jonah. So this one is the book of Ruth. And if you don't know the book of Ruth, it is the most important book when it comes to conversion because it's about a woman who goes through conversion. And uh, this is really uh, the most famous passage or book about conversion. Ron, do you want to read a little bit more at the beginning? Sure. It came to pass that the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. During this time, a man from Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab with his wife and two sons. As time went by, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left alone with her two sons. They each took wives of the women of Moab. One was named Orpha, or, or yeah, and the other Ruth, and they lived there about 10 years. And both Malon and Kilion and two sons of Naomi died. And the woman was without of her two sons and her husband. So she went forth out of the place where she was, taking her two daughters-in-law with her, and they left to return to the land of Judah. You got to go up with them. Oh, no, sorry. <clears throat> Yet Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go, return each of you to her mother's house. God will deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. But Ruth replied, do not force me to leave you or to keep from following you. For whoever you are or for wherever you are, go, you go. I will go and where yet you live. I will live. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, will I die and there will I be buried. God do so to me and, all, and more also, if even death parts me from you. You gotta raise. Sorry, it's different on my computer. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. So the two continued on until they came to Bethlehem. All right, and that passage, <clears throat> where, uh, wherever you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God, where you die, I will die and I will be buried. Uh, God do so to me and more also if even death parts me from you. That's the most famous passage from this section. And of course, it is the passage where Ruth decides to officially stay Jewish. So Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, is living in what is today Jordan. During the time of Judges, say 12th century BCE. And her husband dies and her two sons die so she's left the two daughters-in-law who are moabites and she tells them i'm going to go back home to where i'm from and i want you to go back to your homes obviously that you don't have kids so you can go back home and start over and ruth says no i'm going to stay with you which is a very impressive thing because remember back then often women were a woman's worth or value was determined by her husband and children. And so Naomi's going back home without her husband and children, seemingly without money. They're going to Bethlehem, which is near Jerusalem. And Ruth is going with her and they do not seem to have anything. So Naomi is going back home, as we'll see, to hopefully um, you know, find support from her family or her husband's family. So if we go to chapter two, 
Uh, Ron, would you like to keep reading? Sure. There Naomi had a relative of her husband, a man of wealth of the family of Emelich, and his name was Boaz. Ruth and Moabite said to Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of grain after him, in whose sight I won't find for a favor. And she said to her, go my daughter. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, God be with you, to which they answered him, God bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was set over the reapers, whose maiden is this? And the servant who was set over the reapers answered and said, it is Moabite maiden who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. After meeting Ruth, Boaz declared, listen, daughter of my relative, do not go to glean in another field or go away from here. Now I gotta find it again. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm get... uh, oh, let's see. Right here, you're right oh, here. Okay, I got it. Um, listen, my daughter of my relative, do not go to glean in another field or go away from here, but stay here close to my maidens. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me considering that I am a stranger to you? You gotta raise the roof. Raise the roof. Right. And Boaz answered her saying, it has been fully told to me that all you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to the people which you did not know before. God will repay you for your work and a full reward shall be given to you by the God of Israel under those under whose wings you have come to take refuge. All right, so this is what happens. So they go back home. Naomi goes into her house and kind of stays there, probably depressed. And her daughter-in-law, who's of no relation, goes out to work the fields, hopefully to find favor with the distant cousin of her, of her ex-father-in-law. And what does Boaz see? He sees this beautiful girl or this really supportive or nice girl or something allures him to her. And he finds out this is the woman that he's heard about who came back with his, uh, the distant cousin's wife. And he says to her, um, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. I've heard about all you did and we're going to take care of you. Genevieve, do you have something? question are you okay no worries I just want to make sure I'm so um, what sorry that's my phone ringing oh, okay no worries so this is where we're at so we now know that Boaz has said he's going to take care um, and now we're going to go to chapter three uh, anybody want to read or we should go with Ron who's doing such a good job <laughs> I think, Ron, if you want to keep reading, you got the job. Sure. Then Naomi, a mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek a home for you, that all will be well with you? And Boaz, with, those who, with whose maidens you, you were, not our relative, behold, he winnows barley tonight in the threshing floor. Therefore... Wash and anoint yourself, put on your garment, and go down to the threshing floor. However, do not make yourself known to Boaz until he has finished eating and drinking. 
It will be that when he lies down, you will mark the place where he will lie with you and you will go in, uncover his feet and lie down. He will then tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say to me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did all that her mother-in-law had told her. You're gonna raise up. Sorry. After these things had been done, Boaz spoke to Ruth saying, blessed be you to God, my daughter. Your last loyal kindness is greater than the first one because you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now my daughter, fear, you, fear not. I will do to you all that you ask for the whole city of my people knows that you are a worthy woman. However, although it is true that I am your close relative, there is a relative closer than him. He will have first right, he will have first right to both take ownership of Naomi's property and to marry you. All right, so this is where it's going to get into. You know, all of a sudden, you can imagine Naomi's depressed in bed and, and says, you know, all right, I'm going to try and find somebody for you. And then all of a sudden, Naomi says, well, I met this guy, Boaz, as you mentioned. He seemed to like me. And all of a sudden, Naomi perks up and says, wait a minute, you met Boaz? You need to go wash yourself and anoint yourself and, you know, go down and, you know, be supportive because he is probably a well-to-do single guy and he's related to my husband. And this is where it gets murky because we see that she goes to where he goes to sleep. And so she, it's, it's verse six. So she went down to the threshing fold and did all that her mother-in-law had told her. What does it mean? She went down to the threshing floor and did all that her mother-in-law told her. So there are some who believe that she actually slept with him. Others who say, no, she just was be supportive of him and slept near him. Because the next line it says, uh, later on it says, blessed be you, my God, your loyal kindness is greater than the first because you have not gone to young men. Uh, now my daughter, if you're not, I do to you all you ask for the whole city and people. However, although it is true that I'm a relative, there's somebody who's closer than me. So basically, there's a part there we skipped where it said you need to leave before people see you. I, I didn't put it in there. So basically he says, thank you for wanting to date me instead of going after young, good looking guys, you're going after me. So obviously Boaz is a little older and single. He may not consider himself good looking. It's hard to know, but he does have a really good reputation. So Boaz is kind of inferring that I want to marry you, but why is he not asking her yet? Because right here, however, although it's true I'm your close relative, there's a relative closer. He will have the right to take ownership of Naomi's property and to marry you. Because remember, there's a hierarchy to this. And so somebody else has first right to marry her because if a, your husband dies, the brother has the right to marry you if you want. Still, the woman can still refuse. But if it's not the brother, we learn here, that means it's the closest relatives who has first right. So that means somebody else has the first right to the property. So what does Boaz do now? You might think, well, somebody will want to marry Ruth because he may get some property from Naomi's husband. What is the other issue with marrying another woman? 
there's always the big issue with the next generation. If I am married to one wife and I marry another, and that wife has more children or has a male and the other one doesn't, that means Ruth's children may inherit all of my stuff instead of my first wife, who I want to inherit. So there's always inheritance that is an issue. So this is what Boaz does. He goes and to the gate. And Ron, would you finish this off? Yeah. Can you move the okay. lettering to the left? Can you see it? <clears throat> no, it's still cut off by the pictures on our right. Oh, let's try this. Is that better? No. Yeah, that's good. Then Boaz went up Okay, no more moving it. <laughs> <laughs> then Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And later on, the next of kin of whom Boaz had spoken came by and Boaz said, Hello there, my relative. Come and sit down here. And he turned and sat down. Then Boaz said, On the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must buy it also from Ruth, who's Moabite, and so too marry Ruth. Then her children will share the inheritance with your children. And a relative said, I cannot marry her myself, or I may disrupt the inheritance of my children. Therefore, I give up the right to marry Ruth to you. So Boaz took Ruth and his wife, and God blessed her with a son. And Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. And a woman of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jess, Jesse and the father of David. Okay, so what we see here is... Boaz actually goes before the gate and says, is any relative who's ahead of me want to marry this woman? And so the one who was closest said, I don't want to marry her because it's going to disrupt possibly the inheritance of my children if I have children with this woman. And so he gives up his right to the inheritance to marry her and it goes to Boaz. So Boaz then marries Ruth. And Naomi, of course, is overjoyed. She gets a grandchild. It really becomes her child in many respects, at least according to tradition. But in many respects, the most important part is at the very end because uh, Boaz and Ruth will have a son, and he, his name will be Obed. And who is Obed's grandson going to be? None other than King David. So what we read here is that King David's grandmother was somebody who went through conversion, was Ruth. And so it kind of makes sure we understand that conversion is fine. It's, no, it's just as anybody you can go through conversion, just as Jewish as anybody else. How do we know? Because Ruth's grandson was, great-grandson was King David. So Were they allowed to have two wives? Or they more than this one time, year. yeah. They're not allowed. the The law about two wives didn't end till about two thousand years ago. Really became part, mostly as a becoming part of the Roman Empire, which only allowed one wife. Although the Roman Empire did allow countries that had that rule in, in effect, I believe you could have two wives or multiple wives. But the Jewish world eventually gave it up over time. But at this time, there's two wives. Now, again, we have to understand. Probably the main one of the main reason for two wives was for to have kids because women died very young and they died in childbirth and a lot of children died it, the the infant mortality rate was really ridiculously high so you know women had children young and they didn't all live and you'd have more children and often women would die in childbirth or die young so you had multiple women to ensure you would have kids. And we read this a lot in the, in the Torah, how Sarah had trouble having kids, how 
uh, Rachel had trouble having kids, how Hannah had trouble having kids. So the list goes on and on of women who had, and in some cases, like Leah and Rachel, they used their handmaidens, and those handmaidens became kind of concubines to have kids so that their husband's lineage would continue. So here we see that she not only will have kids with Boaz, but her great-grandson will be David. And even more importantly, the Messiah comes from the line of who? Who does it say the Messiah is going to come from? From the line of David. So the Messiah is going to be coming from the line of this woman who converted to Judaism. Not only that, this book, one of two named after a woman, is much more woman-centric than any other book. The main characters are Naomi and Ruth. There is no main male character. Boaz would be considered like a supporting actor. He comes in halfway through the movie. So he would, if he got nominated for Academy Award, it would be for Best Supporting Actor. So it centers on Naomi's relationship with Ruth and Ruth's dedication to Naomi and how they're able to go back and find a husband who will be kind and generous to her and who will be kind and generous to Naomi. So it's a really beautiful story about how the community is supportive of each other, even though we know we kind of you know, are alarmed by the male-centric nature of the relationships we see. But that's how society was, not just in the Jewish world, but the outside world. But it does show that in the Jewish world, there's an expectation that you did take care of the widow and widows in this case. So, and we don't know much about Boaz. We know he's probably a really stand-up guy. We know he's older and has probably never been married before. We don't know the reason for that. Uh, it could be just fortuitous. Now, when it is means he's older, older could have easily meant 30, you know, over the hill and your life is basically over because the average life expectancy was very young. Um, and we sometimes forget because we're, you know, hovering at 80 for people who are around 80 today. If you're born today, like my children will be expected to live over 100 on average. Who knows if that's going to actually happen or not, but that's certainly a lot of factors. But today we know the average life expectancy is 80. 100, you know, 1900, the average life expectancy age for life expectancy in America was, I think, 41. So that was 120 years ago. Think about what it was 4,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago. So probably was in the 30s. Uh, guys probably lived a lot longer because of the childbirth, whereas we know today women, if you have good birthing techniques and medicine for it, that women will actually live longer on average. But back then that was not the case because of childbirth. So women died much earlier and often in childbirth. Now, if you happen to live through childbirth, I imagine women probably lived older on average than men. But since so many women died in childbirth or because of it, uh, I imagine the life expectancy was much lower. So this is what we learned. It's a great story because we learn a little bit about this time period of Judges, which we don't know that much about. We learn a little bit about the conversion process that is basically just saying, I want to be Jewish and I'll marry somebody Jewish. There wasn't a mikvah. There wasn't a study course or any of that. We learn that it must have been common for uh, Jewish men to go outside and marry non-Jews. And that when they did, the women who married them became Jewish. It was people did leave and go outside the land of Israel, which we know is true because that's recorded in in, uh, in the book of um, of uh, the one that comes right after the Torah, the book of who's the the leader after Moses, Joshua. So in the book of Joshua, we know that some of the tribes went and lived in Jordan. This person is not from one of those tribes because he moved to this area, but his home was in the area of Bethlehem. What tribe is living near Bethlehem? 
We know it's obvious. It's whatever tribe is the line of David. And that is Judah, which is accurate. Judah did live in that area. The tribe of Judah did live in the area of Bethlehem. So it all comes together. So what do we learn about Shavuos? We read the story of Ruth. This is the holiday for supporting those who've gone through conversion. We eat cheese for no apparent reason other than it's the land of milk and honey. It is 50th day. So we count seven weeks to get from Passover to Shavuos. It's called the Omer. The Shavuos is the celebration of the receiving of the Torah. And so we have an all night study session and that it's one of the original main holidays in the Torah. And how do we know? Because it's a Sabbath of Sabbaths and that you don't work. So these, this is the information we have for Shavuos. So again, every congregation does their own thing. Tomorrow night we have our dinner. I'm sure there'll be blitzes or cheesecake or, and then we'll have a service. And then we'll have a study session. We're going to study controversial moments in Jewish history. And then we're going to watch um, a very controversial movie on many levels. Not just because the movie itself is controversial, but whether people liked it or not. That, uh, Of course, History of the World Part 1, because History of the World Part 2 just came out. Any thoughts or questions? I have a question. Yes. Why did you change Lord to Eternal? Well, it's a good point. I meant to do it beforehand. Lord is a male, male word. So often we change Lord so that God is not male. Okay. Because, you know, we try and degender God. Okay. But Thank not you. everybody agrees with that. I like it. I like the idea. Of, you know, for certain things, I like the word Lord, like for 23rd Psalm, Ron. You know, going back to your very first a meeting that we had we had that was a good few years ago you made a statement that god is everything so therefore god is not male or female right and that's it's everything and that's a that's a kabbalistic viewpoint of god thank but, god i have a good memory <laughs> you have a good memory that's an impressive <laughs> memory to say the least ron holy cow <laughs> I don't remember what I had for breakfast <laughs> because I didn't have breakfast. That's why. That's why. Did you have breakfast? I did not. That's why I don't remember what I had because I didn't. Right. right. So we will have no class next week as I'm going to be on vacation, but we'll have class in two weeks, I believe. Just let, let you know. I'll send out a calendar with everything. So we're not going to have class on the 21st. I mean, on 31st. Let me double check that. Yeah, I'm out of town on the 31st, and we'll be back on the 7th. So for the next two weeks, we will not have a class. No, we won't have one next week, but in two weeks we will. Okay. So we're just missing one. Uh, we'll be driving to Tampa that day. Yes. Why Tampa? It's where my mother-in-law lives and my nephew is graduating. Are you going to be in Tampa? No, but that's where I was raised, and uh, we go back quite a bit. Oh, wow. Well, we'll be in Newport, Ritchie. Okay. And I'll go visit my cousins in Tampa, hopefully. Interesting. Yeah, my dad still lives down there. Um, Chris's mom used to live down there. But, yeah, we did. We moved away from Tampa when I was in our 30s. Oh, cool. I knew. Yeah, it's a real Tampa and St. Petersburg are really nice places, too. To visit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't raise your kids there. <laughs> they have to visit. Yes, they have uh, some good restaurants. They have the Dolly Museum. So we like that. So thank you. Manatees. Have you seen the manatees? We have not. We are pro We are maybe doing that this time. We may be okay. doing the manatees with my kids. Actually, funny enough, mm -hmm. uh, we've got graduation, but we'll have a couple of things we'll do. Of course, there's Larry Park Zoo and there's Bush Gardens, which is pricey, but... We have a membership still to Jacksonville Zoo, so we'll probably stop there, either the way there or the way back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So while well, we still have the membership. And they have manatees actually there. You can't swim with them, obviously, but they have them. Yeah. But as you know, when we go to the water, when we go to the zoo, I just took my kids to the zoo two Sundays ago. We don't see animals. <laughs> Get to the zoo. We go on the merry-go-round. We go on the train a couple times. Oh, they have this thing in Tampa, but they also have it in Jacksonville, too. Which is? It's called iFly. Have you heard of it? I I, I have. <laughs> because my cousin's husband owns it. What? what? Yeah, he is. What? Yeah. He's a really brilliant guy. Yeah, he what bought is, the technology. 
it is, is it? it's well it's basically a pretend skydiving thing indoor um, kind of thing yeah it's indoor and the fans actually go up under you but it's it's still fun to pretend yeah. like yeah it's like safe <laughs> skydiving yeah. so my my cousin married this wonderful guy he's brilliant alan and he was on the u.s skydiving team and so he didn't invent the technology he bought it because the technology was used just for like nasa or like the russian cosmonauts and he's the one who said, why don't we just use this technology for everybody and make it fun and make it a, and he's the one who took it around the world and made it a huge deal. So, yeah, but I've never actually done it, but I'll, I got to try one of these days. So I, I, I'm not related to him by blood. I don't have that intelligence in me. <laughs> he's also, really, the Florida Aquarium is pretty cool. Is it? Yeah, we have been, what did we do? No, we went to the dinosaur thing last time we were there to the, to the museum to the, uh, so I don't know what we're gonna do. We may be renting a cabin two days and going by a lake or something. All right, thanks guys. Thank you. Have a good one. I have, by the way, jumped out of a plane myself one time. I did do it in Hawaii. Really scary, but a lot of fun. <laughs> so you guys have a good one. Stay safe. I won't see you next week and we still have to decide, plan a way where we're gonna meet together if anybody wants to host anything in either in June or August, for certainly August, but we may try and do one in June as well. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. Remember, tomorrow yeah, night, everybody wants to come in. Six o'clock is service. Dinner's at seven. You got. You have to call in and I think pay for that, but the, if you want to come in after di dinner just for the movie and this discussion as well, you can do that. We'll see you guys later, and stay safe, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Hog